So this is my first summit, which is a very big honor to be on stage talking, and I think about it this way. I am here on stage asking for your help. Because I am on a mission with my team and with hundreds of people to add the human back into our technology and to add trust back into our commerce. And so when I am in this room, I don't feel like the way I need to start the talk is to get people inspired. I think everyone in this room is already inspired. So the best thing that I could do is maybe share a few of the things I've learned in the last three years um, by going on a crazy summit, and then to stand on stage and actually ask for help. So expect us to be a little interactive. Today's a crazy time to A, be alive, um, and B, be able to change what we're seeing. I think that never has it been more uncertain where we're going, where our economy's going, where our country's going, and that tech exacerbates that feeling of stress. It's kind of circulating through our system. And so if we all took like a deep breath together now, Uh, that's how we start every day at Alfred. The three things that we talk about at Alfred, we, we, we call it a leg up. We've built the company on love, empathy, and gratitude. Those are the only antidote that we know to the troubling, destructive, toxic, negative forces and vices that we've had for millennia living together on this planet. And then the practice that we have at work with each other, uh, there's only one kind of equation that the whole team thinks about, and this is a story uh, that doesn't belong to me, but I'm sharing with, with you, is it's really simple. Look for the greatest constraint in your life, in your business, in your belief system. Look for the greatest constraint. Evaluate the math and look at the equation and say, is there a variable in this equation that I might not be seeing? Could I bend the equation in some way? And then three, write a new story, preferably one that's ridiculous. So let me tell you my story. I went to Harvard Business School, and I was the first woman in my family to go to business school. I got that opportunity because my mother uh, was a teacher, and she worked really hard to give me some experiences that took me around the world and made that application essay look really good. And when I got there, I discovered that a growing number of my classmates were thinking about having a family, getting married, and taking their business school degree and putting it on the shelf. And I thought that was really interesting, because this is 2017. So my best friend and I, who I met at business school, at Harvard Business School, we decided to call all of the women alumni that we could who would pick up the phone of women who were crushing their careers leaders and stars in, in tech, finance, media, venture, hospitality, healthcare. We spoke to over 50 women, and some of them were HBS alumni, and soon kind of like the network of folks that we spoke to expanded from there. And we asked all of them how they did what they did. Every single one of them, not 50, not 80, not 90%, 100% of them had the same answer. Help. I had help in the form of my husband stayed at home. My mother lived with me. My sister took care of the kids. I had an au pair. I had a nanny. I had a personal assistant. At 26 years old, starting the next chapter of my career after working in McKinsey and private equity and working 90 hours a week, I thought to myself, I have an extremely privileged life, and there's no way I can afford a personal assistant or have my mother live with me or ask someone to stay at home because that's not fair. So my best friend and I, Jess, looked at each other and said, is there a way that we can fundamentally change the structure of how we go about our everyday lives? Is there a fundamental way that we can go after the one constraint that all of us have, the one thing that none of us can change, the one scarce, scarce thing in the world, which is time? How could we give people back their time? 
And not just in small ways, but systematically, week after week. All of us have the same needs. We all need to eat, clean clothes, clean homes, clean mental space to have ideas and to have love, empathy, gratitude. So what we came up with was a really simple concept. It was, who helped us? My mother helped me. How could we recreate that for ourselves? And what we did is we hired someone off of TaskRabbit. Her name was Jenny, and Jenny still works with Alfred today. And we said, Jenny, we trust you to help us. Here's the keys to my home. Can you help us pick up food at Trader Joe's or go to the dry cleaner? Because all of these things were really hard to get to from where we were in Cambridge. And it started with those simple, mundane tasks, the chores that we all have on the weekend. And it grew into a lot more. Soon, Jenny was actually acting like a sidekick and got to a place where she was visiting once a week, every week, and starting to anticipate me. She was starting to put food in the fridge I hadn't ordered and that I used to cook and had dinner parties with my friends at business school. She became a part of my life there and a part of my family. And that is what the kernel of the idea of Alfred and where it started. Women, predominantly, have 30 hours of extra work a week than most people in this room. We have two full-time jobs if you want to have a career and a family. So the 30 hours a week of unpaid labor has been systematically, structurally built in to our economy and supports the wealth that we see in the stock market. And it, I really, the gender thing is a thing I like to stay away from. So what do you do? What do you do when you want to start a company with a social mission at its core that's covered in capitalism, that's about female equality? You call the company a male's name. <laughs> Alfred. Um, but seriously, I, there's an Indian saying that what you call a thing, it becomes. It's kind of like an intention that we become um, what we are told. And for me, as a kid, my favorite toy, I had Barbie Dreamhouse, but I would steal my brother's Batman and play Batman in my Barbie Dreamhouse. So Batman, for me, was this amazing superhero because he was like all of us in this room. He was just an average human being, but through the help, support, technology, at the hands of his trusted sidekick, Alfred, and the will he had to do something else with his time, he became a superhero. And that's what we want to do for our customers. So how do we do it? We spent a year in business school, and we knocked on people's doors, and we told them about the business. We sold it literally door to door. And we said, would you trust us to try to help you? We don't know how it's going to work out or what exactly we're going to do. Because I can't get on stage today right now and tell you exactly what Alfred does, because the business is simple. It is a relationship of trust. And what you put on that relationship or what you do with that relationship changes and is different in each house that we, we serve. For a year, we served people, we, took their, we did their chores, we picked up their groceries, and we did a lot more than that. And at the end of the year, we looked at the equation and said, can we make this work? And the only way that the operations of this business worked was with density. So what it required was that you and your neighbors sign up for the service and that one Alfred would serve a neighborhood on a given day, going to the grocery store once for everyone, going to the dry cleaner once for everyone. And in that way, you basically shared personalized, high-touch, high-quality labor for a low cost. For us, that sounded really, really hard to scale. Can you imagine literally having to go around neighborhoods and try to build marketing density neighborhood by neighborhood? But when we went to our customers and we said that we didn't think this was a really good business idea, our customers said, please, I'll pay you more. And that became a black hole and pulled us in. And so what we did is we got on stage and we wrote a new story that was completely ridiculous. I literally got on stage and I said, guys, everyone in the world is going to have a sidekick. All of us are going to have a person who knows us, who cares about us, who anticipates us, empowered by technology, that walks in the front door of your home like a friend and helps take care of the things that take up our time. Um, and we're going to do it by plugging all of the things in the economy that already exist, all the on-demand apps, Instacart, Uber, TaskRabbit. We're just going to plug them all together, and we're ready to go. And that was the tech element of my pitch. The next day, uh, there was a picture of me like this on the cover of Valleywag, and it said, has Silicon Valley officially run out of ideas? <laughs> <laughs> so
So I, I dare you guys to be ridiculous because that headline as a starting point kind of gave me permission to continue being ridiculous because I really didn't care what anyone else thought. We were gonna change the world one home at a time. And so the next kind of counterintuitive thing we did uh, looking at the biggest constraint was the people. So the people in our business, we wanted to be able to hire the best labor. How are we going to be able to do that and pay, pay them a fair wage while offering the service at a low cost? Part of it you heard me talk about was the efficiency piece of it. But the second part was how could we attract and retain a supply pool that wasn't active in the economy? We were literally looking for moms. How could we convince them that this was an awesome job? It was a super mom job. They would be doing mom-like things in many people's homes. And what we discovered is that the best way to do that was to throw, I know this is like lots of gender tropes, but, I, but hopefully you'll see the swirl. I'll redeem myself in the end, was Tupperware parties. We hired Jenny, and Jenny started telling her friends about this job that she had where she got to do what she was doing for her, her house anyway. And the amount of care, respect, and gratitude she was feeling from dozens of people who looked forward to her coming to their home week after week, oftentimes while they were at work and not at home. Jenny formed relationships with people who were not in their home by leaving notes. And every week, small things would happen where you became part of their life and you knew their story. The imprint of whether or not they rushed out of the house that day because they forgot to close the refrigerator or things were on the floor. And Jenny would pick them all up, tidy it up, and you would return home to a hug and the feeling like someone cared. That's magic and it's small, but it accumulates and it changes how people live to feel like they have in their life someone who is taking care of them and making life a little bit easier. So we, we needed to find more Jennies, and Jenny was happy to spread the word. But the other way we did it was to pay a really high wage. A typical uh, on-demand platform likes to do 10.99 labor because it allows them to change the price of uh, what they're paying per hour without um, having to do uh, much about it other than change the wage. You don't have a contract, sorry, you don't have a, you have an arm's length relationship with your employees. So you're not required to train or provide benefits or in the case of something going wrong on the job, even insurance. But a lot of the on-demand guys were telling their employees or contract workers what and how to do things. And we thought to ourselves, well, we don't really want to tell our folks how and what to do things. I think we want to employ the power of their intuition. So we looked at the IRS list of guidelines on how to decide whether or not you had W-2 employees or you had 1099 contractors, and we came up 50-50. We could go either way. But the choice was this. We wanted to have our employees feel like they were the owners of the firm, they were the product, and that they were going to be making decisions that represented this network of trust that was growing every day. And so we decided to W-2 our workers, pay them a really high wage that started at $20 an hour and went up to 30 and over time built more and more business so that we could give folks the option of either working full-time, 30 hours a week, 40 hours a week, or two days a week, and they would still get benefits. And so that became a kind of a word-of-mouth way folks heard about Alfred. The second real problem in thinking about this ridiculous story of all of us having help the ridiculous story of having help be a utility that's built into our lives, that we discovered kind of in year and a half, one and a half of the business, which was people felt guilty asking for help. And over time, what would happen is they would do this cost value benefit in their, in their mind and say, you know what, I haven't really used Alfred that much this week, but I really used them a lot three weeks ago. Um, I feel guilty about asking for help on these small chores, I should do these things myself. And so what we had to do was two things. One was to talk about time and to talk about why time is the only way for all of us to get mental clarity and to 
be present in our lives, and that if you got that from folding your laundry, that's great, but there was always something in your life that you rather wouldn't be doing and we could do for you. But two, more importantly, could we do something ridiculous? Could we change the equation again? So instead of saying Alfred was $90 a month and that you needed to sign up and that we would wait until we got enough density in the neighborhood and then you could have Jenny who would visit every week, once a week on set days, delivering your groceries to your fridge, we said, it's free. Well, how do we do that? We went to real estate developers and we said to them, look, you guys are pumping in water, electricity, and a ton of silly amenities that nobody wants. Why not help? Let's make it part of how your building runs. And here are all the benefits we're going to bring to you. And we aligned our mission and our business to hit a lot of their goals. And what's happened is that now Alfred is in 10,000 homes in three cities, Boston, San Francisco, and New York. And we're literally free for residents to use, and they're using it. So my provocation to everyone in the room is, how do you look for the constraints in your business, write a new equation, and then tell a new story, preferably one that's ridiculous? That's it. <laughs>